On today's Join Us in France, the novel All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Dorr and tips on visiting Saint-Malo and the surrounding area. This is Join Us in France, episode 140. Bonjour, I'm Annie, and today I bring you a trip report with Sophie Moran, who visited the Saint-Malo area, where a lot of the action of the book All the Light We Cannot See takes place. We also talk about the surrounding areas, such as Dinan and Dinard. Ooh, those are good words for practicing your French. Dinan, Dinard. This episode is perfect for people who love the book, as I did, and so did Sophie, and are thinking about visiting the area where the book took place. The shout-out today goes out to Patrick McBride, who pledged to support the show on Patreon this week. Thank you so much, Patrick. And all the other listeners who support the show on Patreon, you are really making a difference, and I hope you know how much I appreciate your continued support. To support the show on Patreon, go to patreon.com, join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, all in one word. Thank you so much. And thank you also, Eve Zuti, for using the Tip Your Guide button on the website. And thank you for your nice note. Also, have a great time in Paris. If you like this episode, you should also check out episode 21 because it's about the Louvre Museum, and as a lot of the book takes place in Paris, you need to learn about Paris too. For show notes and photos on this episode, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash the number 140, 140. You should really visit the website, especially if you are new to the show, and if you are, I say welcome to you, and please stick around, because there is a lot there to help you plan your trip to France. Elise and I are going to lead a week-long tour in Paris between May 14th and May 21st of 2017. If you love France, culture, great food, and a lovely glass of wine now and then, and want to travel with us, take a look at addictedtofrance.com. The inaugural tour is filling up, and so if you have your heart set on that one, don't delay too much. Again, it's addictedtofrance.com. There are two new iTunes review this week that I want to share with you. Visionaria from the United States rated the show five stars and says, there's so much awesome info delivered in an engaging way that always makes me feel like I'm talking to a friend. So good. Well, thank you very much. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. The other new iTunes review is from April in Oregon, who also rates us five stars and says, I love this podcast. I found this podcast recently and now it's my favorite. I listen to episodes during my lunch break or when I'm in the car or just over a cup of coffee in the morning. I'm going on my first trip to Paris in a couple of months, and this podcast is so informative and entertaining. Merci, Annie and Elise. Well, glad to have you on board, April, and thank you for the review. I'm always curious to know when you listen to the podcast and what you're doing when you listen to the podcast. So if you want to tell me, please go ahead, shoot me an email, annie at uh, joinusinfrance.com, especially if it's something unusual. So I want to give the book a little bit of an introduction. And if you haven't read it, and if you can't stand spoilers then really don't listen to the rest of this because I am going to spoil a lot of things. But I feel like I need to introduce it so it makes sense. All the Light We Cannot See is a wonderful novel by Anthony Doerr. It has been wildly popular, but just in case you haven't had a chance to read it, I will summarize uh, what happens in the book. I, I really, you know, I read it months ago and so it was good for me to get a refresher. 
All the Light We Cannot See starts in Paris at the beginning of World War II with a young girl named Marie-Laure who is going blind due to congenital cataracts. Her father works as a locksmith for the Natural History Museum in Paris and he is a wonderful, caring father. I don't think we ever hear anything about her mother, uh, so it's her and dad. One day in Paris, Marie-Laure is introduced to the story of a mythical diamond called the Sea of Flame. The diamond is reported to have mythical powers. Now, this diamond is important because it will drive the plot along because the Germans, who had also heard of it, were very eager to take anything valuable, especially if it had special powers. Marie-Laure uh, loses her sight completely by age six. And honestly, she probably had pretty bad eyesight all along. In order to help her find her way around the neighborhood, her father builds models of the streets. I suppose he does it in plywood, I can't remember. Uh, so she can memorize her way around. In June 1940, when the Germans invade Paris, Marie-Laure and her father flee like a lot of other people, and they make their way to Saint-Malo in Brittany, where they will stay with an uncle named Etienne. Etienne's house in Saint-Malo is on 4 rue Vauborel. Vauborel, 4 rue Vauborel in Saint-Malo. It's very close to the water. It's not a super interesting place today. I uh, looked at it on Google Maps. Uh, but I'm sure a lot of people go because even though this is fiction, we all like to see the places mentioned in the novels we liked and feel the atmosphere and all that. Pretty soon, Marie-Laure's father needs to go back to Paris and along the way he gets uh, imprisoned. Marie-Laure is now in the care of her great uncle, Etienne. Etienne is an interesting man, but he is full of phobias and he never leaves his house. They also have a housekeeper, Madame Manek, who lives in that large house. This, this is an old tall house. I think it has five levels, a big place. This is the kind of house that only really exists in novels. It has uh, hidden doors and traps in the floors and all that good stuff that, uh, you know, uh, I wish it would exist in real houses. It hasn't been in any house I've ever lived in anyway, not even in France. <laughs> we learn that Etienne and his deceased brother, Henri, were radio enthusiasts and they used to broadcast a children's science program just for fun. Sounds like they were early podcasters. They do stuff like that just for fun. <laughs> In parallel, we learn about a young German orphan named Werner. 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 I'm not sure how to say his name properly. Werner. Who also loves the radio. He was raised by a French woman who played a French language children's radio programs for him and his sister. Werner is really good at science and engineering. He can fix radios like nobody's business. He gets recruited into a German military school of sorts where he makes a friend who gets tortured and left for dead because he had bad eyesight and where the commander is truly evil. And that part of the novel was a little hard for me to take, but things like that, I'm sure, happened. Eventually, Werner is sent to the Eastern Front where he helps locate illegal broadcasting stations because, of course, one of the first things German invaders wanted to do was control the airwaves. They wanted to control newspapers, novels, even private letters. Uh, so uh, that was his job, find, track down illegal broadcasting stations. Back to Saint-Malo, Madame Manek, the live-in housekeeper, is involved in the resistance with other women in the city. She hid her activities, but Marie-Laure knows what's happening. And when elderly Madame Manek dies suddenly, Marie-Laure persuades Etienne, her, her great-uncle, to get involved by putting his broadcasting station back together again and broadcast coded messages at night. Now, the coded messages are a historical fact and consisted of saying coded sentences and strings of numbers that only made sense to the people in the know. The messages sounded like 
boring uh, letters uh, that were being read out loud. Maybe they would be saying something, on a volé le vélo de Pierre. And so we st somebody stole Pierre's bicycle. And that meant something like delay the meeting for a week or something like that. You know, it, maybe volé le vélo was, was, the, uh, was the signal. The Germans knew that there were messages in those broadcasts and anybody who got caught broadcasting was shot on sight. So this was a very dangerous uh, thing to do. Marie-Laure sticks her neck out too because she's the one who goes out to a specific bakery to get bread and she calls it un pain ordinaire, so an ordinary bread, and she brings it home. The bakery lady knows that she's supposed to give Marie-Laure the special bread with a roll of paper baked in. And that's the paper that Etienne is supposed to read and broadcast that night. The bakery Marie-Laure goes to is said to be on Rue Surcouf in the novel. Well, there isn't a bakery on that street. The closest bakery you'll find is at uh, 15 Rue Dinan, and it's called La Fournée Malouine. Uh, Rue Surcouf is a little further, but it, it doesn't have a bakery today. I, I didn't really take the time to go into, you know, researching whether there used to be a bakery there or not, but it's a novel. The author probably made that stuff up anyway. But, you know, it's a still fun. You could walk between the house where Marie-Laure uh, supposedly lived and the bakery, and it's about, you know, it's a couple hundred meters Uh, and it's fun because the, the novel doesn't name the bakery. It gives instructions, much like what we imagine a blind person might uh, remember today. It's not quite how it works. I've, <laughs> I, I know a lot of blind people. That's not quite how they do it, but close enough. Um, so the, the, the novel says 22 steps on Rue Vauborel until Rue d'Estrée, and then to the right, and then count 16 storm drains etc. So this is very true. They do count storm drains and, and pipes and posts and things like that. that. That part is very true. Even today, when they go, walk around with a cane, with a, even today when they walk around with a cane or a guide dog, that's how they do it. Um, so all this information that I'm, that I'm rattling off, I will write it down for you and I'll put it in the show notes. And if you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll also get the details with a map that will show you Marie-Laure's uh, path. And so you can, you can f follow it. Um, or if you listen to this episode much after the newsletter has gone out, you can just send me an email again to, to ask me to send you the, um, the, the map. Okay, back to the novel. In the meantime, Werner is actively shutting down illegal broadcasting stations, and he hates that. Uh, he is portrayed as a sympathetic character trapped in an evil machine, which I'm sure a lot of Germans were. Then in 1944, after the D-Day landings, Werner is transferred uh, in a big hurry to the Western Front, to Saint-Malo specifically, to shut down Etienne's Uh, broadcasting station. The, the Germans were getting desperate and were trying to regain control. Thankfully, it didn't happen. Uh, Werner finds Etienne's house very quickly, but he decides to let it continue and to say nothing. And, and now, at the same time, there's another and truly evil German soldier called von Rump Rumpel, who is closing in on the Sea of Flame and Werner saves Marie-Laure from his clutches. Werner meets Marie-Laure and they form a quick uh, but very strong bond. Marie-Laure places the Sea of Flames inside the grotto at the beach and then she gives the key to Werner. The grotto is flooded by seawater at times and is uh, full of sea snails So Werner leads Marie-Laure to safety and, and uh, he pretty much hands her over to the Allied soldiers during the bombings that pretty much destroyed Saint-Malo uh, at the end of World War II. And then Werner dies as he steps on a mine. Then the book jumps forward 30 years when Jutta that's the name of Werner's sister, she goes to Paris to meet Marie-Laure because she has recently met a man who knew Werner when they were young during the war, 
And he told her that uh, when Werner died, he had on his person this little um, house, this little wooden thing, a wooden house. Uh, and that's the thing that contained the Sea of Flame. And But she doesn't know this, obviously. Nobody knows this. So Marie-Laure gets the Sea of Flame back from uh, Juta. And the story ends with an elderly Marie-Laure uh, walking in Paris with her grandson. I am so glad that uh, that Anthony Dorr didn't kill off the blind girl. It was bad enough that he killed off Werner, but, but he didn't kill her off. Uh, the Hôtel des Abeilles was apparently a creation of the author, but there is a place that you can go see where, you know, a lot of this, a lot of these things were um, alive in the, in the imagination of the author. Uh, they didn't, I mean, he didn't base it on real places, but it's still fun to go and see the places, you know, because it's close enough. You can, you can figure out what he was looking at and uh, um, what he based it on. So let's get on with the show. Not a lot of history in the show. It's mostly the, well, history as it relates to uh, the novel, obviously, that we talk about a little bit here and there. Uh, what you need to know is that Saint-Malo is an absolutely gorgeous place. It's very scenic, but it was mostly destroyed at the end of World War II and rebuilt starting in 1948, and it went on for 12 years. And they rebuilt the city as close as they could to what it was like before. So it looks old, but it's not old. And a quick correction before we move on to the episode today. Last week, somebody asked me how to pronounce the name of a famous abbot, and I gave it my best shot, but I have since been proven wrong. I know, it's dismal. <laughs> I hate it when I'm proven wrong. But it's, it is Abbé Suger. Suger. There you go. And now on with my conversation with Sophie, who was very nice to come on the show to share with us what it's like to go visit Saint-Malo and the sites around there that have to do with all the light we cannot see. Hello, Sophie. Welcome to join us in France. Hi, Annie. It's very excited to be here. I've oh. been listening quite a lot to your podcast, so it's good to contribute. Oh, thank you so much. I love that because today we're going to talk about a place that I have not visited myself. So I'm going to rely on you a lot, Sophie. <laughs> because okay, no problem. Uh, Saint-Malo is just, I know it's a beautiful place, but I haven't had a chance to go. So, But on the other hand, we're also going to talk about a book we've both read that lots and lots of people have read. It's called All the Light You Cannot See or We Cannot See. Is it we or you? All the light we cannot see. We. we cannot see. Yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to France and all that good stuff? Okay, well, I am from Melbourne, Australia, and I moved to Germany actually in April 2014 to just have some experience living and working in Europe. Mm. So I work for an Australian chemical company and I have done so since I graduated from university mm. and um, I've been working as an engineer and more recently in supply chain. Excellent. So then I had a role change uh, late last year and in February 2016 I decided to move to France to be um, closer to my team and also I've always been interested in France. I studied French at school and it's somewhere I've visited um, in the past also and so I'm thrilled now to be living yeah. here. And I'm living in a tiny, very quaint little cottage in a tiny village. <laughs> called, yeah, it's called Saint-Pierre-la-Garenne and it's um, really only 200 metres by 200 metres I think in size but it's very quaint. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Okay, I didn't. I didn't warn you about this, but since uh, since the American election, and with every American election, people start saying, "Oh, I'll just move away. 
I'll move to France. I've always <laughs> wanted to move to France. Can, can you give us the, the two-minute uh, summary of what it was like for you to move to France? Um, well, I guess it came up quite unexpectedly. Um, and I think I was very happy that I had the chance because I th think I'd seen over the past years a lot of, I guess, news on sort of youth unemployment and things in France so I didn't think it would be the easiest place to get a job so I was mm -hmm. really thrilled that you know I had the opportunity to move mm -hmm. and I think well I just love it it's I love going to the markets and buying food and cooking up you know yeah. French, French food when you get home and just all the things that make life all the fantastic things that start to become normal is so fantastic. Like just <laughs> driving through Paris or driving home past the Eiffel Tower and, you know, these things start to become normalized. It's just, yeah. you know, you have to pinch yourself so often how <laughs> so beautiful you think you, it is and stylized it is. So would you, you think you might stay a few years? Uh, yeah, I think I'll stay for, yeah, I'm not too sure exactly, um, I guess, Sort of the depends first... what happens with work and all that right. sort of thing. But, um, so yeah, for it's now a long you're way here. from Australia. I do miss my family quite a lot. But yeah. anyway, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> all right. And the French administration mm. was not too difficult for you? It wasn't so easy. So mm -hmm. I'm, I think I'm still getting things sorted, like my health insurance <laughs> and things are just slowly coming through. So, so yeah. But I think you just have to do it and eventually it will work out. You have to be patient, very patient. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So let's let's start our conversation with what interested you in going to Saint Malo in particular. Okay. Well, I, as we said, I read a book last year called All the Light We Cannot See um, by Anthony Dore, and it's one of the best books I've ever read. It's so beautifully written and the, the way he describes things is, is just you can imagine everything yeah and I happened by coincidence to start reading this book um on the day I had visited a coal mine in Zolf uh, in near Essen in Germany called Zolferein hmm. um this this is no longer a, a coal it's a closed plant now but you can visit they've turned the parklands and buildings into um, an event space and where they hold art exhibitions and things. It's, a, mm. it's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, I got home that night and was reading the book and one of the chapters was called Zolferan and I just couldn't believe that <laughs> I'd been there that day. And so, yeah, it was just amazing. That's... And actually the young boy in the book grows up there. So, Verna? I, yeah, I had a real connection to it. Is yeah, Verna. Verna. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how nice. Mm -hmm. How nice. Yeah. yeah, and I read I read this book uh, for a book club. I'm sure lots of people have read this book for book clubs. Or It's one of the most popular books of the last few years. And for me, yep. it was a no-brainer because obviously, I mean, it takes place in France, which I kind of like that. Uh, and it's, yeah. it, has a, it has a blind protagonist. And I have a lot of, a, I don't know, for some reason, I have a lot of affection for... Uh, blind people and um uh, it's it's just a a lovely lovely book so yeah. i think okay. maybe because she's blind you know you the way he describes things you have to imagine them as you can't see anyway so this it's so sensual the rest you know the descriptive and all the other senses so you really imagine the whole yeah. settings it's beautiful yeah and she's so strong she is such a mm. Strong uh, character. I, I really enjoyed reading that. Let's talk a little bit about some of the... So you've went and visited the places in Saint-Malo that have to do with the book. Yes. So, well, it was mostly just walking around the, the city. You could really uh, just imagine exactly, for example, um, Uncle Etienne's house and where he did the radio recordings in the roof. It's all tall houses all around there. Yeah. And when you're walking... Yeah, and when you're walking around the ramparts, you can. There's one particular doorway, just tiny little doorway in the bottom of the rampart, and you imagine this is where um, Marie Loy would go to feel the shells and things. And mm -hmm. um, it's also, yeah, it really comes to life the bakeries and things you can 
you know, imagine her going as part of the resistance and exchanging the bread there and mm -hmm. the hotel that the Germans stay in is, is there as well. So it, uh, I think also just how difficult it would have been for uh, the father to build the model of the town. It really, yeah, it comes to life and it's a beautiful town. Yeah, yeah. The, the way Saint-Malo became rich was mostly because of trade with the Americas and with India. So for the longest mm -hmm. time, it was a, a seafaring city. Uh, there were a lot of brave men willing to take to the sea and, you know, look for treasure or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we need to talk about Jacques Cartier. Uh, yes. <laughs> who was born in Saint-Malo. Uh, yes. Uh, in, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, because I know. Oh, sorry. Know yeah, no, there's that. a statue of him up there's on the as part of the ramparts. There's um, a place called Bastion de la Hollande, mm -hmm. and there's a statue of him, and it commemorates his voyage. Um, he set sail from there in 1534 to the interior of the Gulf of Saint Laurent, Saint Laurent's River in. Yep. Um, And landed in Quebec and Montreal, so it's it's I guess the European discovery of Canada. Yep. So that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, and he also part of drew history. The, yeah, he drew the first maps of the Saint Laurent as well. Okay. Yeah. And um, I saw also that the, it's also the departure point for the discovery of the Falkland Islands as well. Later Is that on. right? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also a lot of pirate history there, which is fascinating to see. And, and the day I was there, it was beautiful, sunny weather, and there were so many sailboats out on the water. It's yeah. just spectacular and sparkling. But, you, yeah, there's lots of stories of um, pirates. I didn't know that the French word for this corsairs, but it's, right. um, they're private pirates, I think. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, so the difference between a pirate and a corsair mm -hmm. is that... A pirate just robs whoever they can. Uh, a, a corsair also robs whoever they can, but they have a, a, a letter from the king during time of war where they can, they are authorized by the king to rob any enemy ship. Uh, I think that's just amazing. I don't know. <laughs> You know, it's such an amazing part of history that this was allowed and, and in fact, encouraged. Yes, so. and it went on forever. It went on forever because the one of the most famous corsairs is Surcouf. He was also born right. in um, in Saint-Malo, and that was 1800s. Right, yeah, there's a statue <laughs> of him there as well. So oh, there you, you go. See that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're very yeah. Uh, proud. So, so these guys, and, and of course they gave a cut to the king, you know. Mm, This yeah, was not course. like the king. I mean, <laughs> I'll give you a letter, but can you imagine, um, you take over a ship and, and you say, oh, here's my letter, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm authorized to rob you. <laughs> It's kind it's of crazy. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, but that's great. that's how they did it. So how did your visit go? Tell us about your visit to Samalo, some of the things you like, some of the things you recommend uh, listeners do mm -hmm. and see when they're there. Okay, so I, I, I just went for the weekend. So I left from work on a Friday night and, and drove over there and stayed the first night in a, a chateau hotel called Chateau Hotel du Colombier. Mm -hmm. And it's a very charming and intimate chateau it's just a 15 room hotel so you feel like almost you you know you sort of have it to yourself the place it's, it's sort of the staff are very friendly it feels like you're almost welcomed into a home wow um, is it an, is it an actual chateau sorry is it an actual chateau Yeah, it's a chateau. It was built in 1715 by um, a man who owned ships for the French East India Company and worked for the French East India Company. So it was his holiday house, I think. And inside there's still, you know, a massive oak staircase and all 18th century wood paddling on the walls. And you can have, you know, dinner in the you know, lovely dining room and there's all lounges and things you can sit in with old chess sets and antique furniture and it's, it's really very uh nice. atmospheric nice yeah makes and feel... they sorry it makes yeah, you makes feel, you feel all, like all a like... king i guess yeah, yeah yeah you're part of royalty now you know 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a little bit out of St. Marlowe, I think probably 15 minute drive or so, but it's set sort of in amongst fields and it's got a beautiful garden and lake. So it's really like being at a, a big country home. Mm-hmm. And I'll put a link to that on the show notes, obviously, so you can find it if you would like to go. Yeah, and I have to say, I think I had one of the best meals I've had in France so far at the restaurant there. The um, oh. Saint Jacques were in season, so I, we call them scallops in Australia. I'm not sure yeah. what other countries call them, but here it's Saint Jacques, so yeah. um, they're just delicious. And yeah, they had beautiful lamb, and it, it was really a lovely meal. Mm. Champagne and wow. very nice. Excellent. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> a good way to start the weekend. I couldn't Absolutely. It was just really set up for an amazing I like, time. I like the sound of that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I think I might go back there one time soon for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hmm. Maybe it sounds like it might also be a good location for like honeymooners or romantic getaway or something. Yeah, I think so. I think anyone mm-hmm. would enjoy it. It's it's fabulous. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And then um, on the Saturday, I went bike riding along Parame. So that's um, just next to St. Marlo. There's a it's more an open expanse of beach and there's many gorgeous beach houses there I think really what I was I I had planned to go and visit St Marlo but what made the the weekend so great was all the different side trips around St Marlo that you can also do Mm. so what was the name of that beach where you went cycling it's Parame P-A-R-A-M-E okay Parame okay Oh, me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, yeah, it's, and I think because it was October, but this day was beautiful and sunny. Everyone was out and about trying to, you know, soak in as much of the last days of the sun before winter yeah. sets in. So it was really lovely. There were people swimming and surfing and running and jogging along. Nice. And so there's always good. boats, obviously, because Saint Malo is, I mean, I looked up Saint Malo on Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. And uh, on any Wikipedia page for a city, they have a list of the sports clubs in the city. And mm-hmm. most of them in saint Malo have to do with boating. I mean, it's yeah. like kite surfing and surfing and um, boating. And they have races. They have all sorts of boating activities going on. Yeah, there were h- hundreds of boats out in the water that day. Yeah. It was just beautiful to see. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Uh, and um, I also went to Dinan, which is a very medieval town yeah, just outside Dinan of Samoa, maybe 20 or 30 minutes away. Yeah, it is. It's all half-wooded houses and tiny alleyways and things. Yeah. And there's a chateau there, Chateau de Dinan, which is medieval as well. I think it was built in 1384, so it's... Very old, and there's beautiful sweeping views of the valley from there, which yeah, I really recommend that as well. Yeah, and Dinan is pretty close. I mean, it's really not very far from saint Yeah, no, I think 20 or 30 minutes by car. I mean, you, you need a car to, to really get around easily, yeah. I think. But, well, um, you, you oh, there's probably lots of people out. biking, but it seems uh, a bit far for, for one <laughs> afternoon, but there is lots of bike routes and things between these towns. Yeah, no, it's yeah. it's it's lovely. Now it's a bit far from Mont Saint Michel, right? Yeah, I think it would be around eighty kilometers, maybe between seven. Yeah, between sixty and eighty kilometers, I think, from Mont Saint Michel. Yeah, so you could. It would take an hour or so. Yeah, you could there. definitely add Saint Malo into a trip to to Mont Saint Michel if you stayed a few days. You know, you could. It's a it's a great add on to Mont Yeah. Michel. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I had a recommendation from a friend that St. Marlo is a great location to go to spa retreats and things like that. So I stayed at on the second night. I changed hotels and stayed at a hotel called Le Grand Hotel des Thames. Yes. Uh, which is more in Parme. Uh, it's right on the water, looks out over the beach, and they right. have a thalasso there. Which yes. Is a, um, it's like ocean a spa. water spa. Yeah. 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 So 
So yeah, there's pools there with all underwater jets and things. And, so what was that and like? Swans and hammers. Oh, it's beautiful. It's it smells a little bit. I have to say, it's got a real. Uh, some a lot of the treatment rooms are sort of algae wraps and things. So yeah. When you first get down there, you can really smell sort of algae and things. Yeah, you're like, no, so, I don't want to go uh, in there. Yeah, so <laughs> I just went in the the sea the sea parts, you know. Um, but yeah. there was lots. It was very popular. There were there were lots of people there. Yeah. yeah, it was very nice. And um, the next, oh, you know, after on the the, I tried to swim in the actual ocean, but it was just absolutely freezing. So, um, <laughs> you know, I usually I usually love swimming. So, um, you know, but this was much too cold for, too cold for me. So mm. yeah, they they have also a lap pool which is ocean water and it's heated, so it's much more um, comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. good. Now, you put in your notes that this uh, Grand Hotel des Termes, it was Mm -hmm. good, but it was large and impersonal. Uh, Yeah, a little. I think... Well, compared to the one the previous night. Yeah, I think the previous night I was... Actually, it was, you know, the previous night was quite a lot cheaper and the the Grand Hotel des Termes, to me, it was too expensive to stay two nights. And I initially thought it would be, you know a real treat to go there but I think actually you know the first one was maybe better but it's just there was a lot of people there and I think the meals and things they're a lot more mass produced and all that sort of Ah. stuff so I mean it was a lovely location a lovely view from the room and everything but um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not so personalized yeah you you preferred the the experience that you had at the Hotel Colombier yes very good very good yeah and then on Sunday I went over to um, Dinard, which is an old seaside resort. I say old because I think it was really roaring, you know, in the 1890s and 1900s when sort of seaside bathing became very popular for people's health. Um, so this is Dinard, not Dinan. Yes, so D I N A R D. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the the most beautiful part of Dinard, I thought, was just they've got um, a whole row of beach boxes or beach changing rooms in an art like Art Deco style, and they're just very beautiful and iconic. And there is so many amazing houses there it was a real place for the aristocracy and royal families and things Hmm. trading families to go and there's a casino that was built and I think you know it really had this this throwback to the uh, luxurious and times and you can see that in the houses and there's uh, lots of cliff walks and things you can do around the area so I walked out along one particular cliff walk and there's all sculptures hanging over the sea and mm. you can look up at these amazing beach houses or old mansions really. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. So really old yeah. worldy and lovely. Huh, interesting, interesting. Mm. So it sounds like you, there's plenty to do around uh, Samalo as well as Samalo itself. Exactly, yeah, and I think, you know, yeah, that's what really made the weekend so fantastic. I think that there was so much else other than St. Marlowe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was, as I said, it was a beautiful sunny day. So St. Marlowe itself, it's very um, inside the walls. There's a lot of tall buildings. So the sun doesn't actually get inside the, the ah. building. But, you know, so that's why I think I was more attracted to be out out in in the sun um, of course yeah but there did i mean there is in all of these towns really great shopping particularly some malo and dinard you know beautiful clothing stores and food shops and lots mm-hmm. of st malo lots of souvenirs and mm-hmm. nice places to eat and all that so it's that's great it's a really easy way to to spend time so can we go back to the to the novel for a minute sorry i'm mm-hmm. i'm i'm I, like okay, so there's in the in the novel he talks about uh, Rue Vauborel, mm-hmm. the great uncle. That's where he has his house. Yes. Um, can you? I, it's a real street. Um, yes. Yeah. You can go and see the house and look up at the, 
you know, at his house and, and all the houses are um, in quite a similar style. So when you're, when you're walking around everywhere, you can imagine the houses, but you can go to his actual house. Yeah. So, mm. the uh, but I mean, this is all fictional, right? This, yeah, I don't well, I think, I think the author must have obviously known a lot about Samalo and um, oh, he made uh, yeah, he did some research on the city, mm, but but mm. the characters are fictional. I'm assuming. Yes, yes, yeah. And it's inter- it's interesting because on the map, uh, Rue Vauborel intersects with Rue de Toulouse. Yeah, so okay. I like that because I'm from. <laughs> Toulouse, you know, I like that. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Makes it easy yeah. for me to remember. But I think, yeah, I mean, in the book, the father builds a model of the town and the town is so intricate. When you get there, you can only imagine how difficult that would have been. So I'm not sure, of course, if it's true or not, but it's nice to imagine. Yeah. And, you know, it's something that's kind of interesting. Let's put it this way. It is not very usual for blind people to learn their way around using a model. Mm -hmm. They learn a lot more by walking around the town and memorizing the town than they do a model. But a model is a nice thing to have to give you an, you know, an overall impression mm-hmm. of the city. It's like, it's like for us seeing a picture taken from a plane. But I think because he knew, I guess the father knew he was at risk. He wanted to, he couldn't stay to look after his daughter. So maybe he wanted, it was his way of making give sure she would be yeah. okay. And yeah be able to survive herself yeah you know if anything went wrong and of course it did go wrong so Mm -hmm. yeah oh and I was rereading the book and and it's so striking when he finally when he gives her the second half of uh, Jules Verne the I can't remember which yeah which Jules Verne's book he gives her but it's Mm -hmm. it's a braille book and so it's huge like all braille Mm -hmm. books and he gives her the first half for one of our birthdays. And then the next year, right before they leave the house, right before they have to run away from Paris, he gives her the second half of the book. Mm. And she can't take it with her. Oh. Because, you know. <laughs> and that was like, oh, no. Let so her she take never her gets book. to read it. Yeah, yeah she doesn't mm. get to read it at that time. So, yeah. Mm. That was... Uh, sad. Yeah, that was sad. The other place that's mentioned in the book is L'Hôtel des Abeilles. Yes, you can see that as well. That's actually very close to the Bastion de la Hollande, which I mentioned ah, just before. Yes. So it's right up on the top. And yes. also there's um, quite a lot of, there's St. Malo, which is the fortified city, but there's also a lot of rocky outcrops in the ocean with smaller forts and things. And I think, even though you can imagine these being used as prisons and things as well during the war. So mm-hmm. it's, yeah, that everywhere you look, there is something that, that from the book. That's cool. Mm, it's really cool. So, yeah, yeah I, I know that they the do real book tours. Tour. <laughs> yeah, they do tours uh, that have to do with events in the book. And they, you can even do, like when Marie-Laure goes out for various things, they, mm-hmm. you can actually, you know, they mapped it out. So the, the tourist services uh, mapped it out and they, and they show you, you know, what, what she did. And even the number of steps, you know, 22 steps to the intersection of Rue <laughs> des and 40 to, till the, till the, the doorway and all that, which is a reasonable way for, for a blind person to, to situate to themselves. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and then counts the steps, and so if you wanted to do it with your put uh, something over your eyes, I suppose you could. Yeah, um, right. What an amazing way to you know <laughs> to do tourism, and I guess the book now is so popular; it's going to really increase the number of people who visit St. Malo. Like, yeah, there were, so there were already yeah. a lot, but yeah, I, I'm I'm getting you know because I'm involved in a guide dog association so that would be a really good fundraiser is to uh, yeah. bring people to saint malo make them do the thing with a guide dog or something and yeah. uh, take their checks at the end <laughs> yeah exactly that's a good idea <laughs> anyway Very evil fun. minds <laughs> mm, no, but, but it would be fun you know innovation yeah yeah it, w- it would be and it's um it's quite rocky you know and uh, well it's like all the medieval cities but it's you know the 
it's very uneven ground. Uh-huh. Cobblestone streets and all of that. And sure. There's lots of steps and things. So it's quite a challenge, I, I would imagine. Even walking around the ramparts, trying to do that with no vision would be quite difficult. It would be really hard with a cane. With a guide dog, it'd be easier. But with a cane, I sh I'm sure it would be treacherous. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And there's also, and they, the, in the PDF that the uh, tourist office put together, they show you the gate of the grotto because at the end of the book mm -hmm. she's in the grotto mm -hmm. and uh, they show you a picture of what they think and you have a picture of one that you think might have been it yeah well that's what i imagined was it and i saw you did send me the one yeah to, you know of that and i i oh, well i didn't see that one particularly at the time but the one i saw i, I yeah i imagined oh that must be it so well they have know. a lot of grottos naturally because it's it's a rocky you know area and so obviously they have uh, a lot of just access to the sea so you you it would naturally have steps down to the sea and then grottos with some with a gate some without a gate Mm. So, yeah. And because it's so tidal there, I think they have like 11 meter tides or something like this. So, I read as much as 14 meters. Yeah, right. When it's the yeah. super big tides, as much as 14. That's huge. It's huge. And so, I guess, that, you know, all these rocks become visible at different times of the day. And when the mm -hmm. tide comes back in, they completely submerge. But there, there's so many shells and, you know, mollusks and different things on these rocks so you can imagine all the hidden little coves that are there mm -hmm. during the day and not at not when the tide's in mm -hmm. there's also a swimming pool just outside the ramparts there's a swimming pool that's constructed and during the day it's completely submerged in seawater and you can only see the, the steps up to the diving board and then when the the tide subsides you can see the, the pool remains as a seawater pool to be used during the day so that's oh very nice very cool yeah yeah that would be a fun pool to swim in and probably because it's in a pool it would get a little bit warmer hopefully yeah maybe <laughs> in between the day i think in summer it would be nice but at this time of, at, in october i think it would be a bit too cold yeah 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 still but good yeah. for the children and things because it's a bit more protected than the, sure. the actual ocean Yeah. Sure. Oh, and of course, mm. in the book, she goes to a to a bakery on mm -hmm. Rue de Dinan, and of course, you can go to that bakery yourself, which I would do. Yeah. I would totally do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's so fun. The, I like the way the the tourist office did it. They give you a whole, like they give you the the maps, and you can just retrace her steps, and that's very fun. Mm. That's a very it's fun just, little. Yeah, it's such a a great way for a city to come alive to yeah. up to life or, or a book to come alive or the other way around. It's hard to tell which is yeah. in which order, but yeah, it's very. Yeah. So this, this PDF I'm looking at is in French. I don't know if I'll find it in English. So I'll put, mm -hmm. I'll put a link to it at least uh, in French and then um, hopefully I'll find it in, in English. Quick addition, since this recording, when I downloaded the PDF I mentioned from the website of the tourist office in Saint-Malo, for some reason, that link is now broken. And it's a very large file, so I don't want it to put it on my own website. So if you want it, uh, join the mailing list on joinusinfrance.com. I'll send it out a couple of days after this episode releases. And if you listen to this a long time in the future and you still want that, email me, Annie, at joinusinfrance.com and I'll send you a copy. What are some of the things that people would want to visit in Saint-Malo, even if they're not on this sort of tour? I'm assuming we've mentioned the Bastion de la Hollande before. Mm -hmm. That would be one. How long does that take to, to um, look at? Well, you would do that on a – you can walk around the ramparts and it's uh -huh. part of that. So, you you know, there's various viewpoints along the rampart walk. So I'd say the rampart walk would take an, an hour or an okay. hour and a half or so. And can you go um, in? Uh, can the, you go in? Into, the Bastion de la Hollande is sort of a park area and okay. you can just have a look at that. Um 
there is apparently a pirate museum, but I struggled to find it when I was there. But um, oh, I'll go and yeah, find it. Yeah, so I mean, I had a, a friend from work had recommended there's a uh, maybe a pirate's house or something you can go in and look around that. Mm. Um, but I, there's lots of places serving galettes, which is, uh, I guess, a um, traditional crepe from uh, Britannia. Yes. Mm. My favorite French food, I think. Um, yes. And lots of other restaurants with seafood and delicious food everywhere and cider, of course. Um, I think I can tell you why didn't you didn't find it. It's because you were calling it a, a pirate house, and it's not a pirate house. <laughs> yes. These are better than pirates, don't yes, you know? Yes, I think this is where I was wrong. <laughs> French, they're much more stylish than not normal pirates. Maybe. So it's called Demeure de Corsaire. Oh, well, Demeure yeah, I didn't... De, Coste, de Corsaire. <laughs> okay, next time I will know. <laughs> Just yeah. don't call them pirates. They'll slap yeah, you around. No, bad, bad mistake. <laughs> bad mistake. <laughs> so, yes, you can visit it. Oh, there's even TV shows that have gone there. And it sounds like, a, it looks like a fun place. They do concerts there. There's a restaurant, maybe. Anyway, tell, tell us about the, the food in Brittany and in general, some of the things that the listeners should not miss, that they must go try. Well, for me, it's a galette. It's just delicious, very simple. It's a wheat flour pancake with, you know, egg. Well, you can have it with all sorts of things, but um, my favorite is galette complete, which is egg, cheese, ham, Mm -hmm. um, it's just delicious. It's and real do they cook the food. egg well or not so much? Is the egg going not so much? So yeah, okay. sort of spills out all over the the galette, yeah. and it's just delicious. And with cider, the the traditional drink in Normandy and Britannia, mm -hmm. Brittany is cider, mm -hmm. um, and it goes perfectly with galette. And then you can have for dessert a crepe with uh, salted caramel sauce, homemade salted caramel sauce, and this is. Very delicious. Yes. Very <laughs> inexpensive and just lovely. Yeah, how much do you pay lunch. for a savory galette? Uh, depends on the place, but I think between, say, six and ten euros. Yeah. Ma maximum ten euros, probably yeah. around eight, nine. Yeah. And maybe the sweet ones around five or six. Yeah. 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 And they serve them with a little side salad or something. Yeah, you can and... And the cider is served in a, a mug. I'm not sure the reason behind this. I don't know if you do why they serve cider always in a mug. That's how they do it. I don't know why, yeah. but that's how you, they no. do it. And there's even places where it's the more traditional thing where there's a spigot and the spigot is going to shoot the cider kind of far away because of the pressure. Okay. And so you have to stand right. back and you have to position your mug just right <laughs> so oh, okay. and you get you get like you get wet from just yeah, okay yeah. Uh, so there's Sounds places fun. where they serve kind of the older tavern kind of style where you'll have a waiter standing there opening and closing the spigot and getting the visitors all wet <laughs> with cider okay, okay. and sticky <laughs> i imagine afterwards and, well it depends if you get the dry cider donc le, le, le cidre brut Yes. That one is not very sweet. Uh, okay. It can actually be a little bit uh, tart, I think. Mm -hmm. And then you have the cidre doux. Mm -hmm. That one is is more to my liking. <laughs> okay. I like the brute because it's got a little bit of alcohol in it. Which is well, they both do. Fun. They both do. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, just that the, it's just that the doux, it's around 3%, 4% alcohol. It's not, you know, yeah. that much. But no, it's very nice. But it, yeah, it tastes good. The brut is is just very dry, and mm -hmm. the dew is not. There's also a uh, aquarium in Saint Malo. Yes, I I didn't visit this specifically, but it looks like it's it's massive. I yeah. think and yeah, a lot there. And then they have a uh, they have a kind of history of the city museum. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They have oh they have a frigate that you can visit apparently let's see yeah yeah it's so this is a this is a, a corsair frigate that you can get in and you you 
pay a fee and you can you can go explore. Oh, but maybe it's not always open. Apparently, this time of year it is closed. So I'll put a link to the internet site, and before you go, make sure that it's open or not, whatever the case may be when you go. But and also for anyone who likes boats, behind St. Malo there's harbours with lots of personal shipping boats um, docked. So if you like boats, you could wander around and look at all the boats. Um, that would be also be a nice thing to yeah. do. Yeah. There's a Maison du Québec in Saint-Malo. Yes. And this is it, this is the Canadian government pays for this and keeps it open where you can go learn about the history of uh, Quebec. There's a Musée Jacques Cartier. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be fun. That would I think that would be really fun to see. Uh, I don't know if it's where he was born. Let me see. Let me see. Yes, yes, it was his house. It was his house, and you can visit it today, most days anyway. See, there's plenty okay. to do in Saint Malo. There's lots, yeah. You could spend really a few days around the region, or oh, yeah. even yeah. a week, if it, depending on. Of course, Mont Saint Michel is close by, and that's obviously worth a visit. And then Saint Malo and all the towns we mentioned, Dinan, Dinan. Yeah. And of course if you if you haven't read the book, you should read the book while you're there. And yes. if you've read it, you should read it again. It's really a lovely <laughs> lovely novel, you know. It I is. Mean, it's yeah. very lovely. I'm sure one day they'll make a movie out of it. It seems like one of those books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm sure it would be it would work really well, especially if they can do it right there on site. If it's you know, if it's done in a movie studio, it's not quite as I love historical movies shot there, you know, where it's mm. the actual. Of course, it's a pain for the people who live there because they have to <laughs> stay off the and streets. Maybe they can but... do it in winter. It's not so busy. That's true. <laughs> Very good. So yeah. do you have any more plans for visiting more of, of uh, Brittany? Well, I visited the Golf de Morbihan recently ah, with, yes. uh, after I listened to your episode actually and I loved that and loved Van. Yeah, was, um, that, was that as good as uh, Elise made it sound? It was. Van in particular was fantastic and so lively. It's, I'm amazed at, in Brittany. It's so remote but it's so lively. Um, uh -huh. And is it mostly was, French people? I would guess it's mostly French yes, people, right? So, yeah. Yes, it is, yeah. And yeah, I stayed in an Airbnb um, near Port Navalo. Oh. Sazu. And, you know, it was a beautiful house, someone's holiday house, which they were renting out rooms. And, yeah, it was really lovely. I think you have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's not really many hotels around there, so you have to kind of do it yeah, as do the it locals way, yeah. do. Yeah, 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 do it that way. And, and yeah. so, I mean, since you're going to be in France for a while anyway, you it's fun. You get to exp you're gonna get to know Brit pretty soon. You're gonna know Brittany much better than I do because I I haven't <laughs> been since I was a kid. Like you know, it's been so yeah, long. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's 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 so vast, France. You, I mean, I'm Australian, so I come from a huge country, and I yeah. assume that you know when I was at school, you hear things like 17 Frances fit in Australia, but still getting from here to Brest is is still a long eight hour drive or something. It's Is that it's, right? It's vast country, yes. Eight hours. Yeah, well, yeah, it's eight hours from from here to Brest. So Oh goodness. Yeah, it's still uh Maybe it's really lousy it's, roads. Yeah, maybe, but well, it's still <laughs> I think you know, maybe six hundred kilometers. So it's it's um a huge country but it's worth worth the trip yeah yeah and we don't have a big desert in the middle like australia no, does, that helps you know? <laughs> so you know it's we actually it's hard to go very far in france unless you're in the la sorez or Auvergne has more places where you can drive maybe an hour without seeing a, a town but that would be the mm -hmm. most you could drive in France without hitting a town. I used to live in the Western US where, you know, some places in Wyoming, you can drive three hours and not see anything, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a little bit uh, different uh, mm -hmm. by comparison. But it is good. If you get a motorway, you can go 130 kilometers an hour usually, and that, that helps get, get around quickly. 
Yeah. It's fa- faster than we can go in Australia. So that so, certainly helps. I'm kind of curious. Life com- Compare life in France versus life in Germany. Is it very different or is it similar? Oh, it's got elements of similarity, but it, it's also quite different. I guess the food markets and things are quite similar. Um, but, yeah, the language is different. The I guess the way people live is a little bit different. I think the Germans are very good at um, being very organized and efficient and everything works very <laughs> very well in Germany and you know life is very easy there here in France I guess there's a lot more throwbacks to art and um and I guess a bit more of a poetic lifestyle so things are not so simple here but there's maybe a richer uh, more museums of art and many yeah. events going on to suit many different tastes and things so that's cool that's cool yeah Hmm. Very interesting. interesting. Yeah, it's good to see. It's amazing to just travel between countries in Europe and they can be totally different and they're just Absolutely. only a few hours from each other. And this is always amazing that you can just all of a sudden be transported somewhere with different cuisines, different languages, different cultures. Oh, and I think fashions, France, everything. Yeah, France in particular has such different cultural identity. You know, if you yes. go to Brittany, it's different from Paris, it's different from Alsace, uh, Provence yeah. is very different, Toulouse is different. I mean, you know, we have very big regional regional differences. Lyon has an identity of its own, you know. Mm-hmm. It's the same Bordeaux. in Germany as well. Yeah. It's very different regionally as well. So, yeah. yeah. So even Bordeaux, you know, as much as I hate to admit it, they <laughs> have a nice <laughs> local culture there too so it's uh, that's one of the nice things about france is and and germany as well and i'm sure all the other countries in europe as well is that you can because in the u.s you can i mean you go from wyoming to like the, okay the mountain west is one thing but it's not that startling i mean i've gone all over the u.s for work and you land in chicago and it's not that different from other places you know i mean there are differences but they're not as obvious let's put it that way yeah i think one of the key differences in Brittany, which i really notice is how well everyone keeps their houses you know there's so many beautiful stone blue stone houses there Mm. which are in perfect condition and I think this is lovely. Parts of Normandy, they have more of a lighter stone but there's unfortunately quite a lot of houses that are falling down or not really that well maintained whereas in Mm. Brittany it seems that the buildings are really well maintained, beautifully painted or always freshly painted and bright and Mm. it's um, that's what I've really noticed about Brittany. Mm-hmm. In they particular, their stuff. they have a lot of pride in yeah. their inherit in their heritage. Yeah, which is really great. Yeah, it's very good. Okay, I think we've uh, we've uh, you know mentioned a lot of wonderful things for people to go do, including myself. I'm gonna have yes, to, I to, to highly go. recommend it. It's a really yeah. lovely, uplifting week uh, weekend there. Yeah, I think if we could. Because even coming from Toulouse, if if we can find, you know, like a long four-day weekend or something, that mm. would be fun. The weather, is it as kind of gray as people like me in the south think it is, or am I wrong? <laughs> well, I was very lucky on the day, the weekend I went. I had a beautiful warm weather. And um, a colleague at work said to me, oh, you're going to go? Do you, do you know if it'll be good weather? And I said, if I waited for good weather, I, I might never go. But I ended <laughs> up having chance. So, but I mean, I think, I think even if it was cold, you would still could have a cozy time. A sure, friend of just... mine said once, um, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear. You know, if you don't have the right outfit. So if you're rugged up, it's worth it. It's still beautiful. Yeah, in uh, in um, in Brittany, they wear those uh, the, the, the ciré jaune. So ciré is like um, it's like a rain coat, uh, but it's yellow. It has to be yellow. <laughs> okay. And, and they look 
they look kind of, I mean, they look very local. Uh, when mm -hmm. we were kids, we all had one all over France, yeah. <laughs> popular all over France. I do find that I go quite often to Honfleur and Etretat because I live not far from there. But And often it can be raining where I live a bit more inland. And then when I get right on the coast, it's just a pocket of sun. The clouds are sort of held back from the <laughs> ocean. So actually you can be quite surprised. You can be sitting in sun in Honfleur and drive, start driving back and it's just pouring and been pouring all day huh. you know, in, in the rest of Normandy. So it can have a little microclimate there. Of, That's good to know. Of sun, yeah. That's good to know. All right. Well, Sophie, thank you so much for talking to me. That was really interesting. I'm going to have, I mean, I started reading the book again on account of our conversation. I didn't get through the whole thing, but I will continue okay. because I'm enjoying it greatly. So, yeah, I might read it again as well. Thank you for, for sharing all that. And uh, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. And I've, who knows? You might have more adventures in Brittany and we'll talk again. Yes, maybe. Sounds good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Sophie. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. To find out about tours offered by Elise and I, visit addictedtofrance.com. Please subscribe to the Join Us in France email list. It only goes out about once a month, but it is where you'll find out about our most recent episodes and you'll also be the first to hear about promos we are running on the tours and anything else new we're cooking up. I invite you to look up the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook, a great place for folks who know a ton about France, exchange tips with those who are just starting to look into visiting France. A bientôt!